sermon lesson this morning comes from Genesis chapter 14. It's a little bit longer passage, so you guys can remain seated for this reading. And y'all have a good time listening to me work through all these names. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Keter Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zebuim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. And all of these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Keter Laomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Keter Laomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Kanaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shaveh Kiriathim, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishvat, that is Kadesh, and defeated the the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and they joined the battle in the valley of Sidim with Keter Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and of Aner. These were the allies of Abram. And when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hoba, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsmen Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. And after his return from the defeat of Keter Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre take their share. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word, even when it seems strange, distant, full of names and places that are hard for us to imagine or place on a map. Help us to see your work in this, as you, how you have blessed the people and the nations around Abraham through blessing him. Help us to see how we as followers of Christ, are here to be a blessing to those around us as well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The 1980s saw the popularization and development of a new term called, uh, known as trickle-down economics. 
This was part of the policies of Ronald Reagan. Uh, there was a portmanteau uh, for this called Reaganomics, and it was also known by anyone, anyone, Bueller, voodoo economics. In case you were wondering, I actually haven't degree in economics, which I thought would never even be remotely useful as a pastor, much less useful in a sermon illustration, but here I am, killing it, finding a way to work economics into a sermon illustration, and I see those eyes glazing and those eyelids getting heavy. Don't go to sleep on me yet. So trickle-down economics is another name for supply-side economics, an older term, and the idea of supply-side economics is that if you set economic policies that benefit uh, businesses and the wealthy, that will in turn encourage economic development and growth as these people and their businesses spend money, right? They start new businesses, they hire people. Uh, this is sort of the idea behind giving tax breaks to Tesla to come and build a plant here, right? That's, that's, that's kind of supply-side economic theory. So the idea is that the money will trickle down into the economy and everyone benefits. So even if the wealthy people take their money and spend their extra cash on, say, well, newer and bigger yachts, the people that make the yachts and run the yachts and work on the yachts and right, the people that are, that are running the marinas and so forth, all these uh, regular people, if you will, will benefit from that. And as you might imagine, there are a lot of debates as to whether or not trickle-down economics work at all, or whether or not they work in the right way. Some suggest that there is, right, but that it's the primary reason um, that we have such income disparity growing in our country between the wealthy and the poor and a shrinking middle class and so forth. Uh, and these criticisms, that's where the label voodoo economics comes from. And... I'm not interested in debating all of this now, and I know that you're relieved and thinking there might be a chance that you'll be staying awake through this sermon. But I do have a point. Previously, God has said that he will bless Abram and make him a blessing to those that bless him, and further, that he will curse those that curse Abram. And I don't know about you, but that sounds a little like what we might call trickle-down theology to me. And I think it's fair enough to exa ask exactly how that would work or how well it might work. Today's passage is actually a, an illustration, an example of how Abram's presence in Canaan works as both a blessing and a curse for those that are around him. It's actually even an example of how we as the church should function as well as a blessing to the people around us. So let's, let's see what we can learn. So the passage begins with this list of four kings that have come to the Transjordan area. Transjordan area is the east side of the Jordan uh, Valley where modern-day Jordan is. Uh, it's right next door to Canaan, or modern-day Israel. Uh, the promised land, of course, where Abram is, is living. And these kings have come to make war on Sodom and Gomorrah and three other sort of city-states that are located in the southern Jordan Valley around the Dead Sea. So you got four kings taking on five kings. And these four kings, uh, we can tell from the descriptions of them that they come from the east. That is to say, they, they come from Mesopotamia. And the reason that they've come is to put the beat down on the five kings of the Dead Sea area, like to beat them back into submission. Apparently about 14 years earlier, they had conquered them, extracted tribute, which of course had to be sent every year, uh, and these kings of the Dead Sea Valley had decided to stop paying up. So basically, if you're the king of an ancient Near Eastern city-state, you're a thug, and this is how you roll. So, the problem is the uppity kings of the Dead Sea area have made a big mistake. And the kings from the east come in, 
hot. They come in from the north. There's a big desert in between them, so they, they kind of go up and around, and they come down, and there's, a, there's a, a, a big highway that runs right down the valley. They come right straight down there, and they route them quickly. Run for your lives, or run for the hills, you might say. Some run literally, some run figuratively, some run to the tar pits that are scattered around the southern part of the Dead Sea. And the way it's translated in the ESV, it sounds like they sort of accidentally fall into the tar pits as they're running, you know, pell-mell away from the enemy. Uh, there's another way to translate it. It could just mean that they actually run and jump into the tar pits intentionally to hide. And given that this is their territory, and they probably know it like the back of their hands, they probably even, you know, mined stuff out of those tar pits, I think it's more likely that they went on purpose. Either way, going into those tar pits saved their lives because the kings of the east give up the chase. They're tired of that. They go back to the cities, and they collect their loot, which is, I mean, that's what they really came for to begin with. They take anything they want, including people like Lot and his family and all his stuff, and we know already that Lot was quite wealthy. We're also told, by the way, that Lot is now a resident of Sodom. If you remember before, he was kind of living near it. Now he actually lives in the city, which means he's part of this mess. And clearly that was a bad choice. One of these guys that escapes and runs to the hills goes west. He goes into the hills of Canaan. He finds Abram and his friends at home outside of Hebron. That's the place he was living in, in the last chapter. He's been there for a little while. He tells Abram about these kings and say, he says, look, they've taken your boy Lot and they're headed back north and east to go home to Mesopotamia. And at this kind of point, I mean, honestly, given the recent past, you're kind of wondering what's going to happen. Because last week we read about how Abram and Lot couldn't get along and their herdsmen couldn't get along and there wasn't enough room for them and they split up and there was... Like, there was this tension between them, and Lot didn't leave on the best of the terms, right? Abram uh, sort of gives him dibs. He takes the best place for himself, and they split up. And it's also mentioned that, you know, Sodom was a wicked city, and Abram knew that it was, and he knew that Lot had made a poor choice, throwing in his lot with the likes of them. And it wasn't going to end well. And they're not getting along. And we're still, in the past, every time that Abram has encountered a dangerous situation, like, say, the one with Pharaoh, he's kind of acted like a, a coward. I mean, you know, he sells his wife off as his sister. And he's just really not presented himself as either a warrior or a man of courage in the face of danger at all. Another thing I note is, to this point in the story, God doesn't seem to be anywhere present, and every time we get a story where there's not, no mention of worship, Abram also tends to take the wrong actions and chicken out. The one thing Abram has shown himself to be good at is he's a good businessman. He keeps making money off of everything that he does. Is... Going after these guys to fight a war, a good business decision for a shepherd. Doubtful. Fortunately, blood is thicker than water for Abram. He musters his army, 318 trained fighting men. That's a surprisingly specific number. And it would have been a sizable army back then, though admittedly nothing near the size of the army that Pharaoh had, or for that matter, probably the size of the army's of the kings of the east that had come. In addition, he's got whatever his buddies, Mamre, Eshkol, and Aner, could raise uh, from their clans. So you've got these kind of four local chieftains and all of their people from Hebron that set off to liberate Lot and company from the kings of the east. The posse rides, or, well, it marches, and they march a long way. They head north, and they catch up to them near the city of Dan. Dan is the far northern edge of Canaan, uh, right before you get basically to, to Lebanon. Uh, it's at the, the headwaters of the Jordan River and, and the foot of Mount Hermon. And he catches them there. This is about 125 miles from Hebron. 
And Abram may have had a smaller force than the four kings, but he employs excellent tactics. He makes a surprise attack at night, catches them off guard, defeats them. And now it's time for the kings of the east to run for the hills, which in their case means to just head back north and east towards, towards Damascus, as, put as much territory between them as they can. They take as much of the plunder and the people and everything they've got, the loot they can with them. And then Abram finally catches them all and rescues Lot and his family and, and all the stuff and everything uh, a little bit north of Damascus, some 170 miles from home. And then Abram returns with Lot and, and company and all the stuff and the people that have been taken from Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities by the kings of the east. And given all the travel that's been involved, it's now been a couple of weeks since the defeat of Sodom and the king of Sodom's come out of his hiding hole and sort of tried to return things to normal. So when Abram and company get back to the vicinity of Jerusalem, which at that time would have been known as Salem, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him in the king's valley, which is sort of, well, we're not sure exactly, but it's likely the intersection of the Kidron and, and Hinnom valleys, which would be just outside the city. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, comes out to meet Abram as well, because, like I said, those valleys are right there. And then we see a sharp contrast in the way these two kings respond to Abram's victory uh, and the liberation of all these people and their, you know, their stuff that was captured in battle. Though the king of Sodom is mentioned first, Melchizedek is the first one to act and the first one to speak, and he celebrates Abram's victory by bringing out a feast, right? He, he shows immediate gratitude. Bread and wine is sort of a merism for a, a full meal and, and a, a celebrative one uh, at that, a luxurious meal to celebrate the victor. And though he uh, wasn't apparently defeated in battle by the kings of the east, it's surely to his benefit, really, honestly, the benefit of the entire land of Canaan, that Abram has defeated these kings because they're far less likely to come back marauding in the area anytime soon. Abram, Abram has effectively secured peace for the entire land. So then after presenting the meal, he pronounces a blessing upon Abram. And Moses notes for us that Melchizedek was not just a king, but he was also a priest to the God Most High, who is clearly the same Lord that Abram worships. And it's, it's truly a remarkable thing that sort of catches us a bit off guard. I mean, who knew that there were other worshipers of the Lord out there? And Melchizedek becomes this sort of extraordinary figure in the Bible. He only shows up in two other places, Psalm 110 and Hebrews 7, and, and we'll talk about uh, who he is and, or who he may be. Uh, uh, later in the school of discipleship class after, after the service, if you want to stick around for that. But the truth is, we, we really don't know that much about him. There are some that actually consider Melchizedek to be a pre-incarnate Christ figure. Regardless, what Abram clearly considers him is a, a legitimate representative of the Lord, and he gives a tithe. That is, he takes one-tenth of all the spoils from the battle— and from the victory, and gives it to Melchizedek. And it's, it's, it's worth noting that this sort of, this is like a ceremony, right? You've got this feast, a blessing, and, and a tithe that's given. It probably represents a solemnization, if you will, of a treaty between Abram and Melchizedek. The king of Sodom, his response is completely different. He, he expresses no gratitude whatsoever, He's actually benefited more directly than Melchizedek by Abram's victory, but there's not even a cursory word of thanks offered, much less a feast forthcoming from him. And rather, he seems obsessed with the spoils from Abram's victory and making sure he gets his part of it. He, he, it sort of makes it sound like he's being magnanimous. You take all the the money and the stuff, and let me take the people back with me. But the reality is, the whole thing is incredibly presumptuous, because he doesn't have a right to any of it. He didn't go 
and win the battle. And so his lack of gratitude and his preoccupation with the spoils, his greediness, it's strange and it marks him, it's indicative of his wickedness. Right? That's, that's the way he's being presented. And Abram wants nothing to do with him. He went to save his nephew and his nephew's family, and the last thing he wants is anything to do with the king of Sodom. He doesn't even want his stuff, even if his stuff is rightly his now. He doesn't want so much as a thread or a sandal strap, the least little thing that ever belonged from the king of Sodom, because he doesn't want the king of Sodom to have even the slightest notion or idea that he has some claim to benefiting or making Abram wealthy. Abram wants it to be clear that every blessing that he has comes from God. So he's happy to align himself with Melchizedek, but he doesn't want anything to do with the king of Sodom. And it's not an outright curse explicitly, the way he handles this, but it is a harbinger of the bad things that are to come. Instead, what he says, he says, look, the men who have fought deserve their shares. And that includes his allies, Anner and, and Eshkol and Mamre. They, they probably had a, a temporary arrangement for the purpose of their, of their war, and they're supposed to get their share. But he personally won't profit from this war in any way, shape, or form. This was not a mercenary act on the part of Abram. Presumably, Lot is left with a choice of his own where he would go. Sadly, we know that he returns to Sodom. So what are we to make of all this? Well, as I said, I, I think it's an example of how Abram becomes a blessing to everyone around him. He brings the presence of the Lord into a very secular situation. It's interesting, this is actually the first example in the Bible of, well, really of kings and city-states or the wars between them, these sort of political uh, arrangements. And Abram isn't a king, but he functions like one in this context. And he uses his wealth, his power, and his resources to defend the weak and rescue the vulnerable. He rescues his nephew Lot when Lot, he really doesn't owe anything to Lot anymore. And everyone around Abram, his neighbors, his family, the the kings of the region, the cities of the region, everyone benefits. Lot benefits. Melchizedek benefits from Abram's willingness to risk essentially everything that he has in order to save Lot and his family. And what is particularly striking about that is that even the king of Sodom, who is clearly a wicked man and very greedy, benefits from Abram's love of his neighbor. And Abram declining to take any of the spoils actually means the king of Sodom benefits even more. On the flip side, the kings of the east and their armies suffer for their greedy marauding of the other nations and the peoples, and they, they lose because they have effectively cursed Abram by harming his family in the form of Lot and Lot's family. Further, even though God is not in view at first in this story, he is brought into view by Abram's response to Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. And Abram's response to both clearly indicates that he has been trusting and relying upon God in the entire process of the story. So God's blessing to all of these people is mediated through Abram. Abram is a blessing to the nations because he is faithful to the Lord and trusting in him. And so God blesses Abram's efforts, and in turn, Abram is a blessing to those that are around him. Basically, Abram saves and or blesses pretty much everyone in Canaan and the Transjordan region with his rescue mission. He's, he's a hero. Of course, this story could have gone another way. Abram could have chickened out like he did with Pharaoh. 
That doesn't mean that God wouldn't have saved Lot or the others, but it does mean Abram wouldn't have been, been the vehicle for the blessing of everyone. So just like in trickle-down economics, there is always a possibility for the people of God to mess up, if you will, God's blessings. That's what it means for God to use secondary causes, that is, us, to accomplish his will. And he chooses to use his divine providence anyway, in spite of us and our failings. And all of this is true of the church. We have received rich blessings in God's grace, in Christ. And we are now called to be a blessing to all the people around us by loving our neighbors and even, as Christ says, our enemies. Now that doesn't mean we're supposed to mount up an army and go attack the kings of the east or whomever we perceive our enemies to be. Not only are we called to love our enemies by Christ, but Paul makes it clear in Romans 13 that the power of the sword has been given to the secular governments of the world. But it does mean that we should do what we can to protect and defend the weak and the vulnerable around us, whomever that may be. It does mean we should love and care for the poor and the disenfranchised among us. It does mean that when others are hurt or damaged, that we should do what we can to make things right. And we should risk and use our abilities, our possessions, our money, everything that we have, just as Abram did, to help people. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what we're praying, what we're saying, is that we want things on earth to look like they do in heaven. If we're willing to ask God for that, we should be willing to do what we can about it. We're saying we want justice, we want blessings for all of God's image bearers. And it means that we care about those that are suffering in our midst. Folks, sin and brokenness are everywhere around us. There is no limit to the people that we can love. Who is God calling you to love? Who is your enemy? Who would be most surprised? Who would see clearest that whatever you're doing for them has to be because of God, because there's no good reason for you to do it. It also means that we shouldn't worry about someone like the king of Sodom, the wrong person, the person doing the wrong things, whatever that might be, benefiting from our efforts to love our neighbors and our enemies. It's the liberality of God's grace and the generosity that spills over into all sorts of sinners that marks his generosity and will make it be seen in us. And that's how he saves some people, some people that we would never expect him to save. But the generosity always extends to those that won't be saved. I mean, think about Judas. How many blessings did he receive serving as a disciple of Christ over the years, Jesus knowing all along that ultimately he would betray him. He wasn't worried about the benefits that Judas received. And we need to be just that generous with everything we have. Certainly we should be shrewd, we shouldn't be careless with our money, but we can't worry that we might be taken advantage of. Friends, this is how the grace of Christ becomes real in our lives, when that grace poured into us begins to spill out upon people around us and into our community. That's how it becomes real to them, too. Because how can people believe in the grace of God if they can't see it in God's people? They see us, they meet us, they deal with us. God is in heaven. His kingdom is as real on this earth as we make it. That's why we're here. And this is where the hope of the gospel shines the brightest. When we take the forgiveness and riches of God's grace and use it to love those that are around us. And it becomes realer in our hearts and our lives, too, when we see that happen. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the great and amazing changes we could see in Abram, even over a few chapters. We know that that gives hope even to us, as flawed and weak as we are, as sinful as we are, that you might change our hearts and minds, that you might give us the courage to be as generous as he is in this story. And we do ask that you would do that work in us. We confess that we are not able in and of ourselves. That we are weak and selfish. We are fearful that it is hard for us to part with what we have. Help us to be generous to those that are around us with our time, with our resources, with everything that we have, that they might see the truth of the grace of Christ in us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.